Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today, maybe one of the most important topics in category theory that I was using implicitly in quite a few videos by now, namely adjoint functors. And there are so many motivations to study adjoint functors that I decided to completely split it into several parts. So this is kind of more the algebraic motivation of adjoint functors and also the algebraic definition of adjoint functors. Um, there are also many, many ways to define, so equivalent ways to define adjoint functors. And kind of so the slogan for today is that adjoint functors are like life and life is not invertible. Um, it, really, it would be really, really cool if you could undo your mistakes in life, right? If, if you, life would be invertible. That would be really, 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 really amazing. I certainly think that life is not invertible. I would like to redo so many mistakes that I've done in the past, but I can't. That's just life. And s one Functors are a little bit like that. Um, life is not invertible. So s one Functors are also not invertible. So let's actually have a look at this, as I said, algebraic motivation of adjoint functors. I will kind of shift all the examples into an extra video as well, because adjoint functors are so important that I will spend quite a few videos on just adjoint functors. It's one of the crucial main observation in um, kind of modern old category theory, modern old category theory, brilliant. Uh, so from uh, Daniel Kahn, from the 60s of the last century. It's actually pretty new compared to how many examples there actually were before, you know, kind of generalizing this concept and collecting it under the umbrella term of adjoint functors. Zillions of examples. Um, today, I will only show you one, um, but I promise you there will be zillions, so just, just bear with me for now. Okay, so um, the slogan is, as I said, life is not invertible. So functions or whatever you, you consider are usually not invertible. A good example, and actually an example of an adjoint pair in the end, we'll see, is a ceiling and floor, uh, so um, rounding functions. So if you take a look at whatever, some kind of nice way to go from the integers to the real numbers, that's not so hard, but to go the other way is a little bit questionable because there are just so many more real numbers than integers. So that's certainly not an invertible, there's no nice invertible way to make that work. Um, so going from left to right, you just include, you just said zero to zero, one to one and so on. But going the other way around is not so easy. There's no really good function, as I said, from the real numbers to uh, the integers. You need to collapse something, right? You, you need to somehow get rid of a certain number of uh, well, objects in the end, if you want, because it's not invertible. There's no really a, any nice invertible way um, to go from, from one way to the other. Um, so I say it here, there's no invertible way to assign an integer to a real number in a strict invertible sense. In a non-strict sense, of course, you can set zero to zero and the opposite to set zero to zero. But uh, to do with well, what to do with all the other real numbers is a little bit of a question. And the ceiling and the floor function. So I never remember which one is which. Um, and there will be a left-right issue, and I hope I got it wrong. But anyway, so I think this should be the ceiling function picture and this should be the floor function picture. So everything here uh, up to not including two is sent to, to one, right? So um, the, floor, uh, the, the floor function, this was probably the ceiling function. This is probably the ceiling function. Um, so the floor function um, should send everything below two, whatever, 1.9 to one. And this is kind of nice. It's kind of an approximation to an inverse. You assign to each real number an integer in a very controlled way. And of course, ceiling is just the same, just in the opposite direction. Um, yeah. So in this kind of approximation of inverses, that's what I would like to call them, at least today. As they are no inverses, that they approximately do what you want them to do. All right. So approximately pi is three or four, depending whether you use ceiling or floor. Um, but anyway, uh, so approximately, this is a really good, good way of thinking about those functions. Approximately, it's a good way to think about those functions and their approximations to inverses. And it's kind of the motivation for, um, well, for actual functors, they're like pseudo inverses. So if you have this picture, F and G, so F goes from C to D, so two categories, and G goes from D to C. Um, there are those three notions you can come up with what f and g could satisfy. Well, they could be equivalences or isomorphisms where I would write down an equality sign. So 
FG is the identity, GF is the identity. The more useful one, well, it's, not, it's kind of a wrong notion in category theory. It cares too much about objects. In category theory, you shouldn't care about objects. So here, there's really the quality in objects, and, and we don't really need that. So bijection object, we don't need that. Um, the way to weaken that is to use equivalence. So instead of um, saying it's an isomorphism, you're saying it's equivalent, and then they're just equivalent as functors. And it, it's much better. It's really, really much better. Most most functors between categories should be some number. Well, most functors between categories are nothing. But most NITA functors should be some kind of equivalences, and isomorphisms are really, really, really rare. Um, and the idea is, OK, this seems to be cool. This seems to appear relatively often. This is kind of, this is kind of not good from the category theory point of view. This is, this is awesome. But it appears very often, but maybe not often enough. So maybe you can just weaken that. And instead of having any equivalence between them, you just have a map. Um, so kind of you weaken the condition by ignoring the object in some sense completely. And I will make this precise in a second, right? So this is the adjunction. So adjunction, this one here. This is the equivalent. And it should be even, uh, by the way, by this picture, I won't say that probably anymore. But isomorphisms and equivalences are examples of adjunctions. It's a more general picture. It generalizes the idea of having an inverse, right? So an a left adjoint, a right adjoint, that's what we will see, is like a left inverse and a right inverse. It's kind of this generalization. And then, of course, inverses are uh, included in the picture. They come for free. And the only thing we want in the end is this funny inequality here. So we only care about having isomorphisms on uh, morphisms, on arrows, because we're doing category theory. I don't care for objects. I only want isomorphisms on the level of uh, arrows. And what this means is, and in another video, not today anymore, because this is algebraic notation, I show you a really beautiful um, topological interpretation of this isomorphism. But anyway, for now, just what we want is a bijection on arrows, right? On morphisms, on maps, and not on objects. I don't care about objects. Um, think of this as like a Fourier transform. You have f, and you have an f hat, and you have an inverse operation g, and you have a g hat, but only on arrows. And you don't really, you don't care about objects. You, you don't even care about objects. Um, and it's really built on the following, and this is where the notion adjoint comes from. Every matrix, a matrix would be an, an morphism, an arrow in our vector space category, has a transpose matrix, which is uh, an adjoint. I should have put an adjoint in quotation marks, not transpose. Let me try again. It has a transpose matrix, which is this adjoint matrix. Um, and it satisfies this a very, very similar looking property uh, compared to this one here. Right? So you can kind of shift the matrix from left to right. And that's what you do here. You shift the functor, so here's f from left to right, and it changes into g. And this is really this property that you want. If you would play around with this idea of generalizing um, isomorphisms, inverses, you will actually come up with this equation anyway. But now I'll just take it for granted. If you move f from left to right, it turns into g, which kind of tells you that there is some order involved, which we'll see in a second. And that really sounds like what we want, because now each f here has an associated f, 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 whatever, uh, hat, which is the transpose. And each g on the other side has an associated g hat, which is the transpose. And I haven't talked about, as I said, objects at all on this slide. It's only about errors. It's an equality on errors and a bijection on errors. Every a a map has a Fourier transform. And from a Fourier transform, you can go back to the original map. That's how you should think about it. Um, it really, really makes this definition fly. And here's an abstract formal definition to functors f and g. So f goes from c to d, and g goes from d to c. They form an adjoint pair. Well, there's some left-right nonsense involved. So f is the left adjoint, and g is the right adjoint in this picture. Um, so that's why f and g, if there's an isomorphism of this form. Uh, well, a natural isomorphism means it works for every x and y, but you want this isomorphism of home spaces. f of x and y uh, is, is a home space with an arrow space is the same as x and the g of y. Just be a little bit careful. It's not super important, but this happens in d and this happens in c. So f of x is an object in 
D, Y is an object in D, G of Y then goes in the opposite direction, X is an object in, in C. That's what it is. Um, so an adjoint functor is this idea of generalizing um, an isomorphism in exactly the sense, or an equivalent in exactly the sense, that you only want this Fourier transform type property on the home spaces. Um, that's the only thing you, you require here. You can shift F from left to right. F is the left adjoint. You can shift G from right to left. G is the right adjoint. And that's kind of the defining property here. It's a bijection on objects. It's this transposing matrix, taking the Fourier transform, whatever you want to call it, operation. And um, well, they satisfy the usual yoga. And in fact, you can, you can formulate them as type of universal objects in a certain category. Um, but let's ignore that. So the, the famous slogan in uh, categories for the working mathematician in the, in the book, in the book, still the book for category theory, is that adjoint functors truly arise everywhere. As I said, it is not quite clear from this definition, but in the end they do. And um, I will show you just, I will just have one video just for the examples um, coming from it. There's so many examples of adjoint functors. But for today, the only examples I mentioned so far are all equivalences and all isomorphisms are actually form an adjoint pair um, in this case. But there's also another one, of course, the, the ceiling and the floor function are actually adjoint functors for the inclusion, I never remember which one is the left one, which one is the right one, but apparently I wrote it down. Um, so the ceiling function is a left adjoint. So remember, Yota is the inclusion from Z to R. And uh, apparently, the ceiling function is a left adjoint, and the floor function is a right adjoint. If you would work it out, uh, just you, you will see that this is actually exactly the case. And it comes from those two equalities here that I've written down here. Um, anyway, so the point is you can form a category. So you can make uh, R and Z into a funny category. So just um, the object are just the elements of R and we ignore them anyway. The object of Z are just the elements of Z and we ignore them anyway. The point are the arrows. You draw one arrow between X and Y if X is lower than Y. So I don't want to draw this category. This gets a bit messy, of course. But anyway, so we draw one arrow between x and y if x is lower than y. And in this category, from r to the corresponding subcategory z, and from z to r, there you have this adjoint functor pair. And if you just write down, funny exercise, if you just write down this condition for this category, um, you will see that these are the two equations that you would need to justify that this is really an example of an adjoint pair, right? So ceiling and floor function are not just approximate inverses, they are approximate inverses in the sense of adjoint functors. So adjoint functors, first motivation for adjoint functors, they generalize inverses or equivalences, and of course then they have to be important. But I think it's kind of a fun idea to play around with this um, example of a ceiling and floor, which is kind of a really fun Let's be called the real world example. It's not really a real world example, but you get the point. A real world example of adjoint functors. And in later videos, I will show you way, way more examples. Keep on, keep the slogan of Saunders McLean in mind that adjoints arise everywhere. Um, for now, I don't really expect that you like adjoints, but maybe you like the idea that adjoints are kind of uh, this generalization of inverses or pseudo inverses. And I also hope you like the video, of course, and I also hope to see you next time.